Okay, hey, we're back with operating systems, and this is on chapter number six, process synchronization. We've already talked about process synchronization a bit, but what I want to do is give you a few more details to fill in the information that you might be lacking, um, or that may, may not necessarily have been covered in a lot of detail in the process synchronization I've given you so far. <coughs> so what we're going to look at, and this is a few other algorithms and a few other implementation details because you may want to do some of this for your copy file assignment, assignment number three. So we'll be looking at the background. The critical section problem, just to review a little bit. So today's lecture is a bit of a review, but puts the pieces together, hopefully, for you. Uh, synchronization hardware semaphores, the classic problems of synchronization, which is what you're going to run into with assignment number three, which is why I spent some time to go over that. Monitors, synchronization examples, and atomic transactions. So, all right, so we know, hopefully, we know at this point that we need processes in order to do CPU scheduling. If we didn't have to worry about CPU scheduling, if we had a dozen CPUs on that computer and we can run a dozen programs, we would run them all simultaneously and we would not be talking about processes and we would not be talking about schedulers or any of these other concepts. In fact, we probably wouldn't even be talking about threads either because it would be one dedicated CPU to one dedicated program. So the reason why we're talking about all this stuff is because we don't have a dozen CPUs on the computer. <laughs> we only have one. And in order to get the user experience of Windows and multi-threaded and multi-processing, we have to create this elaborate abstraction about it, which is what we've been talking about so far in the elaborate abstraction, is taking and creating this concept called the process and taking the process and loading it up into memory and then scheduling it so it can run and then making it run with other processes. So other processes might actually work together, which is why we talked about process synchronization and which is why we have a copy file um, assignment coming up, uh, number three. So concurrent processes run concurrently. Concurrent access to shared memory may result in data inconsistencies. You're going to see that with your copy file program. It, because what's going to end up happening <coughs> is that your input file and your output file aren't going to match. Well, they might. If you, you know, actually some people it does. You know, the first time you write it, it matches perfectly fine, no problem. And, that, and you're just the lucky one. Uh, but most of you, 90% of you, are going to have two mismatched files. And you're going to be saying, well, this works. It should work. Why is it not right? And then you'll spend most of your time trying to figure out why it's not right. Uh, and it won't, well, unless you get really lucky. Or sometimes you run it, it works, sometimes you run it, and it doesn't work. If you're actually synchronizing two processes running simultaneously together to facilitate this CP with a producer and consumer model, 90% of the time it's going to mess up. It's going to mess up because of the shared access. They're both sharing a piece of memory, and something's going to go wrong with it. So, um, Unless you have it done serially. If you have serial process, one process could take the entire file, copy it up into a buffer, and then the other process, and don't do this because then you're not synchronizing anything. You're running it serially. You can actually spawn a process, a thread, take the file, open it up, load it up into the buffer, and then you can actually kill the process if you wanted to. Or create another process, or have, a, have this process. Take all the memory out and write to a file. That's not really what you're supposed to be doing. That's why you have the N and the M, the size of the buffer, and then the size of the maximum amount the producer and the consumer can work with. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the important critical part of it. Otherwise, you might as well just use one process for it, because that's what you're doing. So people say, well, why do we want to use two? instead of one. Isn't it much easier to take the entire file, copy it up, and then take the entire file and put it back down? Well, on faster processor systems, well, that might work. On slower processes with multiple processes running simultaneously, it's slower. It's faster to use, too, because you get twice as much processing power. How do you get that? Because you get, from CPU scheduler, two entries into the scheduler instead of one. <laughs> So your buffer and your consumer are getting more CPU time, which is why you're doing this. See, a lot of students fail to realize why in the world we want to do this. What, 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 what purpose does this serve? And it makes the, run, the program run faster. So the Unix CP command is done with two threads. Producer and a, it is a producer and a consumer. So you're really writing the CP command in that assignment. 
So, uh, so what you have to do in order to get <coughs> the benefit, which is the speed of execution, the kind of consequence to that, the cost you have to pay is higher maintenance on process synchronization to keep the data in data consistent. So maintaining data consistency requires a mechanism to ensure that the orderly execution of cooperating processes exist, which means there's some rhyme or reason to the order. So you put rules in the system that says, if the circular buffer is full, then the producer can't produce anymore, and don't even bother trying. Just let the consumer consume everything. <laughs> or if the consumer is trying to consume and it's taking more than the buffer the producer can produce, then slow you down, you don't run as much, and then allocate that extra processing time to the producer. So that's the synchron that is all the synchronization you need to worry about. Um, so suppose you want to uh, provide a solution to the consumer producer problem that fits all, <coughs> that fills all the buffers. So you can do so having an integer counter. So you have a counter that keeps track of the buffers and the number of full buffers. Initially, the count is set to zero, and it's implemented by the producer after it produces a new buffer, and then decremented by the consumer after it consumes one of the items from a buffer. So lo and behold, what we're looking at, and this is C code, by the way, and this is why I said it's probably easier if you write the program in C, because I'm showing you a sample producer here with one mechanism. This is called a counter-controlled buffer using a counter. Um, oh, let's let's uh, let's stop for a second. We need to do attendance. Oh, that's okay. Okay, we're back. And uh, during our brief little break here for attendance, a question was asked, and I want to I want to do this for the for the benefit of everybody else because if you guys had this question, I'm sure everybody else is going to have the question too. You can't have one run and then the next one run. The the idea of the synchronization is to have them both run together. And so naturally what's going to end up happening is you're going to have to figure out, well, how do we stop the producer and how do we stop the consumer? That's what we're talking about right now, or I'm talking about right now, actually. So you have to make it so the producer <coughs> produces enough but doesn't produce too much to fill up the buffer and that the consumer doesn't try to go consume something if the buffer's empty. Or, you know, you don't want, because they're both going to be racing. So the interesting phenomenon here is we have a couple different conditions. We have a race condition or we have starvation. So the race condition is when two threads are going for the same buffer simultaneously. Whoever gets there first is going to be able to perform or be able to execute something. Well, if the consumer just keeps getting there but there's nothing in there, then the producer can't get in because the consumer is in there. And so that, that actually leads itself to deadlock. Deadlock is when well, we have a race condition when both processes are going for the same shared resource. One of them gets there before the other one. And in this particular case, it could cause a deadlock. And the deadlock is going to exist when consumers are in there trying to consume, but the buffer is empty, but won't let go of the buffer. <laughs> it's going to hold on to the buffer as long as it can, because it's trying to consume. It needs to consume five. We told it to consume five. It's in there, but it can't consume because there's nothing in there. And it's preventing the producer from getting in there to put five in there. That's a deadlock situation. We also have starvation. Starvation exists when one process can't run because the other one is running, and it won't let the process run. So if you make the buffer too slow, too, if you make n too small, the number of bytes, let's say you made the maximum up to 50, and you made... Uh, each one of the increments, so M is 50, N is 1, the producer is going to start putting in 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 50. Consumer is going to starve. It can't, it can't do anything. It's not going to get a chance to run because the parameters that you have on the producer are too high. So it's kind of an interesting assignment because you'll have to create N and M randomly, or maybe just fix M and create N randomly is what, it, is what I meant to say. And then when the producer is out there trying to produce and it's filled up the buffer because it's run too many times, you have to tell the producer, stop, go to sleep, wait a little bit so that the consumer can come in and get rid of that stuff. So it's kind of like um, 
it's an interesting scenario. So anyway, that's what we uh, talked a little bit about during the break here. But uh, long story short, uh, that's what the assignment's about. <laughs> so I can't answer all those questions for you, or not all of them, but I can tell you what the scenario is. I can't answer how you're going to make the producer stop, how you're going to make the consumer stop. I have no idea. Depends on what programming language you use. Languages that support, going back to this concept up here, some languages actually support semaphores. What language is that? C. But it doesn't support it on all platforms, only on Unix. So it's an operating system related issue where Unix is going to give you mutexes, semaphores, stuff like that. Java is going to give you synchronization. Not in hardware, it's going to give you a software synchronization. So you're going to use different techniques, or monitors as Java as well. You're going to use different techniques for different environments. You pick out the environment. You pick out the operating system you're going to write it on. You pick out the programming language you're going to write it in. And then you're going to need to determine from that point forward how you're going to synchronize the producer and the consumer. So. OK, we ended here with the producer. And in the producer model here, we have uh, C code that's showing you a counter. So it's producing um, a variable counter. This is one technique for implementing this. And after each one of the producers, so while true, and then we're going to switch to false eventually, produce an item and put it into the next produced. So while the count is equal to the buffer size, so OK, do nothing. Uh, so here we have buffer n is going to be equal to the next produced, n is equal to n plus 1, uh, figuring out the buffer size. Up to, so anyway, what, what we're looking at down here is the counter. So count plus plus. Count plus plus is going to imp implement, excuse me, increment the counter until the while count is equal, doesn't, while count is equal to the buffer size. Well, that's going to inch. Oh, I don't really like the way this code is written, actually, which is why I probably don't even want to go over it. But what we're looking at here is inside of the activity that the producer is doing to populate the buffer, we're keeping a counter and we're checking the counter and then we're going to stop when the counter equals a certain amount. And then on the other end, we have the consumer. So while true, where count uh, is equal to zero, so if this comes back true, then do nothing. <coughs> Else, what we're going to do is consume, we're going to go counter minus minus. You could do this actually quite easily in any programming language to keep track of what's in the buffer. Just use a counter. There's five, six, seven, because you know how big the counter is. And here's my race condition that I talked about. So counter plus plus could be implemented as this, where we have register one is equal to count, register one is equal to register one plus one, count is equal to register one, count minus mine, minus minus can be implemented with register 2 is equal to count, register 2 is equal to register 2 minus 1 because we're minus minusing now and then count is equal to register 2. So consider this execution with interleaving with count is equal to 5 initially. What we have is a race condition where I just basically told you in other words uh, a few minutes ago where we have a producer and a consumer whoever gets there first is going to go minus minus whoever or plus plus regardless of what's going on. Might be interesting when you put this together to put some uh, output to the screen. It says producers in producers it because then you'll see producer 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 consumer 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 and you go oh that's not synchronized. What you want to see is they're interleaving. So we have producer consumer producer producer consumer 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 oh, producer. <laughs> So it'll be interesting, and it'll look different every time you run it if you're using random numbers for the end. <clears throat> so the blue is the uh, producer, the red is the consumer in here. So we have a producer, producer, a consumer, consumer, a producer, consumer. So. And then we have the counter that's being decremented or incremented, depending upon who's in there and what's going on in there. So. So the solution to the critical section problem using mutual exclusion. So if process P1 or PI, whatever process number there is, is executing in the critical section, then <coughs> no other process can be executing in the critical section. 
So it's one at a time, which is our definition. We're just revisiting the concepts of these definitions. <coughs> so there has to be sufficient progress, which means we have to get closer to releasing. Otherwise, we get starvation out of this. So if no process is executing in the critical section and there exists some process that wishes to enter into the critical section, then the selection of the processes will, that will enter the critical section next cannot be postponed indefinitely. That leads to uh, starvation. So there has to be some sort of a process made. So how are you going to make pro progress for the process of how are you going to make progress? As I keep saying process, but I meant to say progress. <laughs> how are you going to make progress? Well, you could just cut it short through an aging technique to say, if the producer's producing too much and the consumer's been sitting too long, it's called aging, where the consumer is sitting there waiting. It gets old. It's wait. After it ages for so many time, stop the producer. So how are you going to do that? Well, you could keep another counter. <laughs> that says, if, and this is a way you can possibly control it actually, if the producer is, pr produces more than 10, we're going to let him go in as long as he wants to go in. You can go 1, 6, 5, oh, more than 10, then stop. Dec decrement his counter or do something to him <clears throat> to change another value that says, if you wanted to use a variable counter as an example. And then go back and say, well then if the consumer is uh, zero, because he's zero, and then producer's now zero, we're in the consumer. So you can age it by keeping track of how many times the particular person has been into the critical region, has been using it, how long they've held on to it. If you wanted to use a timer, you could do it with a clock tick or a timer, but that's hard. You could probably just use it with uh, any sort of counter mechanism would work for that. We also have bounded waiting. So a bound must exist on the number of times that the other processes are allowed to enter into the critical sections. After a process has made a request to enter into a critical section and before the request is granted. So the waiting is controlled. So assume that each process executes at a non-zero speed. No assumption concerning the relative speed of the end processes. So we're not looking at the speed of the processing, we're looking at how much time that they've spent or how much time they have not spent in the critical region. So it's more, more along the lines of controlling who's, who's going to be in there and who's not going to be in there. Peterson's solution. So this is not, again, this is not a process synchronization thing. This is a solution to the problem. It's a two-process solution which means it could be used for producer-consumer. So we have multiple processes, and then we have two processes scenarios. Producer-consumer is a two-process scenario. So you assume that the load and store instructions are atomic, that they're done separately. So that is, it cannot be interrupted, and they're done separately, and they um, cannot be preempted. They're definitely, um, they need to run, and they need to run serially. The two processes share two variables. So we have a turn, so an integer turn, and a Boolean flag 2, which is going to be two Boolean variable for flags. So the variable turn indicates whose turn it is to enter in the critical section, and the flag array is used to indicate if a process is ready to enter into the critical section, then it's true, implies that process number one is ready, or number two is not ready. So if you're ready and it's your turn, then you go into the critical region. So it uses a two process, excuse me, a two variable solution to a two process synchronization where if you're, if it's your turn, but you're not ready, then you're not gonna, you're not gonna waste CPU time to go into that critical region. So if the producer has already produced everything and it says turn, you're not running. <laughs> Or, you know, because the buffer's filled and the producer's not ready to produce anything else, then if it says turn, he's not going to run. So here's the algorithm for process PI. <clears throat> We're setting a, a flag, essentially. It says, it's my turn and it's true that I'm going in. If it's my turn and I'm false, I'm not going in. So 
can imagine. And then another thing to note here, actually, which I should point out, is we're using loops for everything here. This is not using operating system support. This is purely controlled by the programmer. And this is the slowest way of doing this. <laughs> Why? Because every time we check, we're wasting a CPU cycle. Which is why we have hardware support and we have operating system support for this. Which, if you don't have access to it, you're not going to be able to use it. Doesn't really matter how inefficient your solution to assignment number three is. Some of you will create very, very inefficient, poor design solutions because you'll do it in Java or you'll do it in uh, another language where you're not using semaphores and mutexes and stuff. Because what you want to do is essentially have the operating system control the processes instead of the user. This is a user mode solution, by the way. User mode solution doesn't use a system call interface. It uses processes and threads, but it's not using the system call interface to control the interprocess communication. Instead, it's just controlling, um, you know, through programming language at a higher level API in the user mode. It's creating this. You're you're implementing a wait. On the pro you're slowing it down. So if you do it this way, it's actually slower than if you just had one process doing it <laughs> in reality. So you may not necessarily see the end result of it um, or why you're doing it this way. So if you wanted to do it correctly, then you use a system call interface, you use the operating system support, and you have multiple processes running. That's faster. This is slower than writing just one process and running it that way. But you're, it's slower because you're at the user mode and you're implementing a loop. And the loop is going to sit there and you're going to put a wait in there eventually. So you have one run, one. You're implementing cycles into the software. So, But that's a slight tangent. Let me go back to this example here. While true, we're going to loop through and we're going to check into the uh, critical section or not into the critical section, depending upon whether we're true or false, on whether we're ready, and whether it's our turn or not. So the solution that came out made it a synchronization hardware make this run a little bit faster. So many systems provide hardware support for critical region code. Is a Windows system going to do it? No. Why? Because we don't know what hardware we have. Uh, how do we know that we actually have this hardware on the computer? We made an operating system that works on many different architectures, hardware architectures. In fact, you don't have to buy a computer from Microsoft. You don't, in fact, Microsoft doesn't sell computers. Other people sell computers. <laughs> They just make an operating system. You're going to stick it on this, this software, which is why the tablets are actually kind of interesting because they make the tablets. So, uh, well, they don't make them themselves, but they're coming for they, they're determining what hardware is going to be on there. If you can determine what hardware is on the on the system, you can write an operating system to op optimize it. If you don't know what hardware is on there, you can't optimize it. You can do it through a driver interface, but long story short. You're not going to take full advantage as you do like with other companies like Apple is an example that makes their own hardware <laughs> and they make their own operating system that works with their own hardware <laughs> so they can work with it. So on the assumption that you have your own hardware and you're an operating system vendor and you know what's on there then you can implement the critical section code in the hardware instead of having the software pro the programmer do it. So unit processors uh, could disable the interrupts where you currently are, you're currently running code would execute without preemption, and generally too inefficient for multiprocessor systems. So what you're doing with this concept here, you're basically turning on and off your hardware through the interrupt interface to simulate the processing. But you're generally going to the time wasted in turning on and off is going to be slower than if you just ran it sequentially. So operating systems using this not broadly scalable. There are some operating systems that do interrupt disabling, but uh, not very popular. Modern machines provide specific atomic hardware instructions, where the atomic says non-interruptible, which makes uh, most of your I/O is non-interruptible. By the way, um, so it's easier to test memory word and set the value or, or swap the contents of two memory words. So, um, what does this mean essentially? And when it comes to I.O., most of the hardware synchronization fit in with I.O. is that if you, like, open up your CD-ROM drive, you can't interrupt that. It's going to run until it's done opening, and then it's going to come back. Because if you stopped it, 
the mechanism itself would never work. So, um, so it's more vocabulary versus anything else for you right now. Test and set instructions. So you can write it from a software perspective, set a Boolean, and uh, test the, the, ar the, ar the argument and then remove it. So if it's false, then it turns to true. If it's true, then it turns to false after you test it, which basically says go out and see what the value is. If the value is on, then make it off. So you're switching it back and forth. So here is a solution using the test and set technique. And the test and set technique here is a test uh, that you're going to implement from a software perspective using your um, C code or something of that nature. You have a shared Boolean lock, a variable lock, initialized to false, and then you switch it. So it's basically a way of taking the two processes and going, you're on, you're off, you're on, you're off. And they both can't be the same value. So while true, while test set the lock, then don't do anything. Lock is equal to false. Sorry, implementing a software lock to keep track of the um, of who's got access to the critical region and who doesn't. So, or a swap instruction is an example here. Swap the value. So you're taking a temporary variable and making a making it equal to a, making it equal to b, making it equal to a, making it, which basically simulates a on and off again. Makes makes it so that you can switch it back and forth. So a solution using the swap, and this is just sample code examples. So share variable, variable lock initialized to false. Each process has a local Boolean variable key. And then the solution is you're going to go back and forth. So if the producer is producing, you can set his variable to on. And then the master program that's running this can check and say, oh, it's on. Then the other one has to be, has to be off, producers, consumers off. And then when you switch them, you switch the two of them. So it kind of leads to the concept of what an operating system can do in terms of a mutex, which is an operating system support for the same concept of a switch. It's on or off, on or off. And one signal is the other one. It's using a signal interface. So what is a signal interface? Well, instead of having to constantly check for the value, which is a kind of a pooling technique where you go, is it on, is it on, is it on? which wastes CPU time. If the kernel can do it, it's much faster, because the kernel can just signal, go on, go off. It's like the traffic car. It's like the automatic light signal instead of the guy standing out there directing traffic himself. So works a little bit better that way. So here's the concept. It's called a semaphore. <laughs> semaphore uses a wait and a signal system call interface, which means has to be implemented in your operating system. Windows does not support this, but Unix does and Linux does. Um, so synchronization tool that does not require a busy wait. A busy wait is when you're busy waiting <laughs> to see if you can get into the critical region. What does that mean? There's a loop. And because you're set to false, you're not true. If you're true, you can go into the critical region, but you're set to false. But we still got to visit you occasionally to know that you're going to be true or are you false. So we're checking your state constantly. So if we have a pool of processes and some of them are true and some of them are false, well, let's just say we have two. One's true, one's false. We still got to check to see, are you true? Are you true? Can I go in yet? Can I go in yet? Can I go in yet? That's a busy wait. So a busy wait implements CPU clock, uh, it utilizes a CPU every time, which, is, which creates the busyness. Every time it checks to see if it can run, it's busy doing nothing. <laughs> so it adds time to the, to the amount of time that the entire program is going to run. So it's going to slow down your routine. So not so good. So we want to get rid of the busy wait. If we get rid of the busy wait, then we can do a signal and a wait. We can tell the process to wait, and then we can signal to it and say, hey, wake up. <laughs> so it's like an on or an off versus wait because somebody else is running, and then wake up and run now. So we have the kernel doing this through the system call interface because the kernel controls the processes because the kernel is doing the scheduling and the kernel is kernel's making everything run, not the user mode. So you might as well have the kernel mode do it. If you do that, then you've got a faster running system. So two standard operations are a wait and a signal. So originally called P and V, well, it's just wait and signal. So it's less complicated, 
and can only be accessed via two indispensable atomic operations, which means one of them has to run constantly until it's finished. So all, everything completes for this one, and then it signals to the other one. So the processes themselves are signaling to each other. So you put a weight on one, and then you put a signal, signal on the other. And the other one says, wake up. So one process, when it's done, is going to wake up the other process. That's the fastest mode possible, because then there's no busy wait that's going on from the user mode. It's the kernel that's keeping track of all that. So a semaphore, this is called a semaphore, by the way, and more vocabulary for you. The semaphore is the wait signal, and the semaphore is what you, you, what you use through the, it's the term that's called that there's a system call wait, there's a system call signal that you give a systems program with multiple threads to synchronize through operating system support. You can create, and this is actually, this one's using a counter, so it's actually using a software implemented semaphore. Traditionally, the semaphore is operating system implemented through system call interface. You can create the same concept using software in the user mode. <laughs> but you're introducing busy wait when you do that. So you've implemented your sort of demoing or sort of using that same concept, but you're using a counter and you're looping it because you can't get the functionality unless you have the kernel do it. So Semaphores as general synchronization tools counting semaphores. So they're inter and which is what, if you're going to implement this concept from a software perspective, without using, with or without using the system call interface, you're going to do a counter semaphore. So it's an integer value, or you're going to use an on and off a Boolean semaphore. Um, it ranges over an unrestricted domain. So integer values to count one, two, three. Or a binary semaphore, which is a zero or a one. So it can range from zero to one. If you're going to do a binary semaphore, you're doing a mutex lock. A mutex is an on and off single valued semaphore. <laughs> so you can do that in software too. You just call it integer mutex. Mutex is equal to zero. Mutex is equal to one. Mutex is equal to zero. Mutex is equal to one. Well, if we're going to do that, then we can have a hardware or we can have a software or we can have an operating system implementation of this. The operating system calls it a mutex. You can actually call it anything you want from your programming perspective. Um, but the word mutex comes from an operating system support through the system call interface, where we create a mutex. What well, is very similar to a Boolean on and off kind of thing, except for the operating system keeps track of it, which is safer than if the system keeps track of it from a software perspective up there in the user mode. Because what if you accidentally change it? What if it gets changed incorrectly? Then, and then each one of the processes has to be shared between multiple processes. It could get corrupted. So you move it down a level, put it in the operating system from the kernel perspective. Kernel locks it in. Kernel keeps track of all that stuff and runs it faster. So that's why a lot of people like the system call interface. What do you get with Java? You put the word synchronization next to it. You get some, well, you get monitors, but and I'll talk about that in a few, but you get the same thing. So within the JVM of the Java environment, you get the mutexes and the semaphores done for you automatically through synchronization. Synchronization says make it so that it communicates and it doesn't cause, it avoids deadlock and avoids starvation, all the other issues for you automatically. So Java will do this for you automatically. So it's a lot easier. However, when you use synchronization or synchronize in Java, hard to know what it's doing. <laughs> So abstractly, it's easier to work with from a programming perspective, but it's harder to understand what is what is it we're exactly doing here, and why do we need to put synchronization? Why do we need to make this synchronized? So, so you can implement a counting semaphore S as a binary semaphore. Here's to provide the mutual exclusion semaphore S, initialize to one, wait S, go into the critical region signal S. So it's a series of wait signal, wait signal, so. Here's the semaphore implementation. You must guarantee that no two processes can execute wait and signal on the same semaphore at the same time. Otherwise, you get deadlock or race condition. Whichever one gets there first is going to do it.
determine what happens. So the implementation becomes a critical section problem where the weight and the signal code are placed in the signal in the critical section. So only if it's in the critical section, only one process can work with it. They're never going to do it simultaneously. So the process ordering becomes more important. So you go to the center, it's almost like the locked door. You go to the center, which is, which is another good scenario for this actually. You're trying to go, a uh, bunch of students trying to go to office hours. And there's a door in front of the professor's office. You check the door and it's locked. So you wait. <laughs> And you check it, and it's locked again, and you wait. And it's the door, which is inside of the critical region, because inside of the critical region, the professor's going to unlock the door when he's ready. So you go to, oh, it's like the bathroom door. <laughs> Actually, the bathroom door down the hall here, if it's locked, you're not going to go inside. <laughs> if it's unlocked, you might open up the door and go inside. <laughs> and then when you get inside, you're going to lock it, because you don't want anybody else to come in while you're in the bathroom. And yes, lock that door. Actually, there's a lot of people that don't lock the door. And then I open up the door, I'm like, but there's somebody in here. And then as a process, I get confused because the mutex was set incorrectly. Because <laughs> somebody inside the critical region didn't do their job correctly. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a good scenario right there. In fact, then I should create a new assignment, the ITU bathroom door. The ITU hall bathroom scenario. Uh, let's see. Uh, so that's a weight and a signal that can be implemented by a semaphore, and that's the semaphore implementation, by the way. So the implementation, because of critical region problem, so could now have, you can now have a busy wait condition in the critical region. Well, how many times have I walked over to that bathroom door and checked it and it's been locked? And then I go back, and I come back in here, and then some other student, it gets unlocked, some other student goes in. And then I, it's wasted time every time I walk from here all the way down the hall to go check the door and it's locked. Sometimes, actually, when I walk out, I go, is it going to be locked? A, a process really can't do this because if it's going to be locked, then I can go upstairs and use the room. The rooms are, and then sometimes I, I'm going to bypass this because I'm shorter in time. I'm not going to go over there because that could be locked. I'm just going to walk this way. Instead. I'm going to go to the left instead of the right because I'm a thinking process. <laughs> well, if I think about it that way. But most of your processes in your programming language aren't really going to think that way. They're just going to keep going to the door, going to the door. Unless you put a routine in there. So if you go to the door five times, actually, I have the same routine. If I go to the door a couple of times and it's locked already, I'm not going to try it again. <laughs> I'm not going to go to the other direction. <laughs> so we we'll talk about operating systems today, um, going to the bathroom. <laughs> the problem with the door. Now, if there was a sign, this is a good solution to the problem. If I had uh, if I had kernel level support, if the university put a little sign in there that showed, like you can see it down the hallway, I could look down the hallway and it could be red or it could be green. This is what the airlines do actually. If you go and you're you're in your seat and you want to use the restroom, there's a light that if you haven't noticed it, most of the airlines do this. Is a green or red next to the bathroom? If it's green, it means it's empty. I'm not going to waste my time walking down the hallway to go check the door. So that's what we need over here. So you're right over here in the hallway at the beginning. Lights here. So is it open? Is it closed? So then as a process, I don't have to waste my time. So it's, it's a classic scenario, actually. <laughs> so, uh, so let's see. That's called a busy waiting, by the way. When you're standing there busy waiting, checking to see if it's green or if it's red, if it just tell, it eliminates the busy wait, because I'm not going to get up from my seat and walk all the way down to the bathroom. If the light is red, unless I'm stupid, then I'll do it. You know, so, well, people don't know that's the light actually. So, <laughs> anyway, long story short, uh, that's a different problem. So, uh, could now have a busy wait in the critical section if it's implemented, but implement it, the implementation code is short and little busy waiting if the critical section rarely is occupied. If we had a thousand of those, it's like the porta potties actually. <laughs> You put in rows of them, and you put a little thing on there. You just visually see open, 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 close, close, close. You know, you can pick the one that's open, any one of them. That solves the problem as well. Make it so there's more options. And note that applications may spend lots of time in the critical section, therefore this is not a good solution. Well, yeah, how many times? Um, 
know, I'm not even going to go into the porta potties at this point. You guys know what I mean by porta potties, right? Portable bathrooms? You get them at amusement parks? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, how many times have you seen lines for that? <laughs> Usually at big events and stuff. Doesn't solve the problem because you have too many processes with not enough resources, which is why this happens actually. So we want to implement the semaphore with no busy waiting because we don't want to, and hopefully, if you remember anything out of today, you'll know what busy waiting is. Going to the door and checking it, and it's locked. So next time you go to the bathroom, go, this is a busy waiting condition. I'm busy waiting for the door to be unlocked. <laughs> and I keep checking it. That's wasted CPU time. Yeah. Yeah, if I counted up how much wasted CPU time I had in my day, it would be probably more, though, more than my valuable usage usage all right so here we have one without the busy waiting because what the goal is to avoid it so it's each time for there's an associated waiting queue and which entry each entry in the waiting queue has two data elements it has the value which is going to be the type of integer and we have a pointer to the next record in the list so we put together a link list of waiting items in a queue and where we have two operations a block and a wake up so we place the processes invoked, invoking the operation on the appropriate waiting queue, and then we wake up. We remove one process from the waiting queue and place it at the end of the queue. That's what is that? That's the line. <laughs> so instead of me having to go to the door, check it, it's locked. Go to the door, check the lock. I just wait in line. So when the line starts forming, we know when it's going to be up, and we can do other things. What can we do? We can daydream. Think about what we're going to have for lunch. Think about all the things we could be doing instead of waiting in line for the bathroom. All that stuff that you're doing in your head, you're processing, is kind of sort of like busy waiting, but it's better than not, because at least you can time it. I can actually hold a telephone conversation on my cell phone. You know, I can do uh, lots of stuff that I might be able to do if I'm in the waiting queue, if I'm a process and I have other work to do that doesn't involve going to that shared resource. So I could possibly get a better implementation. So how am I going to do that? I'm going to implement, here's the implementation of the wait. So <coughs> it's a wait, but it's not a busy wait. So there's a difference between waiting a process and busy waiting a process. A busy waiting process eats up CPU time. A wait process doesn't. If you're smart and you're doing this with operating systems control, where the operating system is implementing a semaphore to wait the process, it's not even part of the CPU scheduler anymore. In fact, all of the other processes run faster now because the operating system is going to put a, oh, we wait, stops it. So it comes up in this PCB process control block and it says, you're next, but we're waiting, oh, leave it alone. You're next, oh, we're waiting, leave it alone. So it runs faster overall. So, which is why you want to do, if I keep reiterating the point over and over again, it's why you want to do kernel level system call interface for this. Most fastest processing you'll ever get. Everything else is going to slow down. You're going to introduce busy waiting when you put a wait in your software level. Here's with a signal. Here's one with a implementation of the wait. Here's the one to wake up. Signal says wake it up. Increment the value. Remove the process from the waiting queue. Wake it up. So deadlock and starvation, just to recap the concepts, you can actually introduce this. Um, a deadlock is two or more processes that are waiting indefinitely for the event that can be caused by only one of the processes. For an event that can be caused by only one of the waiting processes, one of the waiting processes can, wake, can get rid of it, but it's not doing it. So S and Q are two semaphores initialized to one where we have wait S, wait Q, and then we have one of them's waiting for the other one, and the other one's waiting for the other one. One of them can break it, but they're not breaking it, so they're deadlocked. It's like the two cars that go to, in fact, a deadlock situation in a real life scenario is two cars that go to a single lane bridge, and they come in opposite directions. So one of them can go at a time, but they both try to go. One of them has to back up. <sighs> Who's gonna back up? No one's gonna back up. So if you enlist, well, you have one person who will back up. Or it's the person who wants to cross the street, but there's no signal. 
and they can't run out in the street while there's cars going across, they're going to get hit by a car. So instead they wait, and they're deadlocked because there's no way for them to cross that street. So, so we implement fixes for deadlock to avoid it. So on the two-lane bridge, there's a signal that says when it's green on this end, you can go. When it's red on this end, it's green, it's red, green over here, it's red over here. And it switches back and forth. What is that? It's a semaphore. <laughs> Actually, it's a mutex, mutex lock. Locks one direction so the other one can go. And then locks this direction so this one can go. Or what do we do with the person who wants to cross the street? We put a crosswalk in there. And we create laws, or we put a traffic light in there. We say, stop! <laughs> so if we didn't have traffic lights, we would have deadlock occurring constantly all over the place. Because both traffic, would, all the traffic would try to go at the same time. So we control it through rules of the road. And actually, you have rules of the road. You know, like the person on the right, you come up to a situation where you have a stop multiple times, and then the person on the right has right away. So right away is a rule to make those processes behave themselves when there's no traffic light. Otherwise, they're all going to go and they're going to hit each other, which new drivers end up learning. What's the rule on the road? You wait for the person. It's always on the right. This person on the right has higher priority. But you know how many people don't know that? <laughs> I constantly just say, just, just go. Just go. You want to go, go. I know it's my turn, but just go. <laughs> so you wave them on because they have no idea what the rules are. Starvation. It's usually new drivers or it's foreigners who aren't familiar. Uh, starvation. Indefinite blocking. So the process may never be removed from a semaphore queue in which it is suspended constantly. So starvation is just indefinite blocking. The reason why I'm going over this so much is because this is some of the questions that are on the final exam, actually. You know, questions about deadlock, starvation, and waiting. Uh, busy waiting versus waiting. Um, how do you avoid this? How do you avoid that? What, what happens in this scenario? What happens in that scenario? Uh, so classical problems of synchronization, we have the bounded buffer, the readers and writers and the dying philosophers. I want to hit this from a semaphore and a mutex point of view and from a how to solve these problems versus what the problems are. I've already kind of given you some, some solutions, not solutions, some scenarios, but I haven't given you the solutions yet. So the bounded buffer problem, that's what you have. You have a bounded buffer, and you have a circular buffer, but don't worry about the word circular, just think about it as a buffer. N buffers could, uh, each can hold one item. We have a semaphore mutex, we have a semaphore full, and we have a semaphore empty. This is your classic solution to your copy file program number three. You can implement it like a bounded buffer, which it is a bounded buffer problem. Bounded buffer means it's bounded to a size. You're going to write M. Remember the second item? That's your buffer size. So you're creating a bounded buffer solution in that assignment. So here's the structure, the structure of the producer who produces. I'm actually giving you, not this is, you can use this stuff. However, you're not going to be able to do it unless you're on a Unix, Unix system. The structure of the producer that produces something. We have a mutex empty. Well, if it, when you start out, the buffer is going to be empty. Eventually, the buffer will be empty after the consumer consumes everything, too, on each one of the iterations that happens. So you're looking for the empty state. If it's empty, consumer just needs to ignore it completely, turn itself off, and then the producer needs to produce it. If the producer, if it's full, then the producer shouldn't be producing anything. The producer should stop and let the consumer run. So that's the classic scenario for this is a three, it's a three value. It's full, empty, or there's something in there <laughs> kind of thing, scenario. So you're going to signal back and forth between the producer and the consumer to tell each other, hey, it's full, consume, it's empty, produce, back and forth. Uh, so here's the consumer process, it's just doing the opposite of the producer in terms of the signal. So the producer's going to signal full, and the consumer's going to signal empty, that we're done, we're empty. Readers, writers problem. This is what you get with databases. 
Well, remember that I gave you the scenario already on the readers and writers, and we have to control the mutual exclusion. Well, how are you going to implement this? So you have a data set that is shared among multiple different concurrent processes. Whoever gets there first, well, the reader-writer problem, your biggest concern is the race condition. Just think of a checkbook. If all the people come in for the debits before you put a deposit in there, you're going to be in trouble. That's a race condition. That's what you're trying to avoid. So you do the deposit first, and then you do all the write you all the checks after you if you balance your checkbook correctly. So readers <coughs> only read the data set, and they do not perform any updates. And the writers can do both; can read and write. That's when you use your ATM card. It's a writer. It's going to read the value. Oh, you have twenty dollars. Okay, here's five dollars withdrawal. And then if another reader comes in and says, "Oh, you have twenty dollars." You're going to pull out the whole $20. If they do it simultaneously, you're going to have a negative balance if they're reading the wrong value. So you have a lock on it while somebody's reading or while somebody's writing. <coughs> so the problem here is to allow multiple readers to read at the same time. Only one single writer can run. <coughs> so now we have multiple processes. Some of them are reading, and only one of them is writing. So we have uh, the writer can access the shared data at the same time. Only one writer can access the shared data. So we have shared data. So we have the data set. could be the balance. could be the, co in, uh, the contents of the file. We have the semaphore. Mutex, which is initialized to 1. And then we have the write, which is initialized to 1. And then we have the read count, initialized to 0. And then the structure of the writer process is we wait, wait the write. We perform a write. And then we signal that we're done. Okay, we wrote it. We unlock it. It's like a check-in, check-out system, which is what databases do all the time. So if you're going to update a table, only one update's happening, but many reads can happen. And then what they're going to do is signal to the reads, hey, the balance has changed, and then change it, refresh it, or knock it, the readers out, and the readers have to go back in and get the new value, refresh the value. <laughs> So here's an example of the reader-writer problem. The structure of the reader process looks like this, where we're going recount, 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 keeping track of how many people are reading it. And then the reading is performed. And then the recount is subtracted out after each person leaves the, read, the reading process. And then so the writer can perform after all the readers are done. If the recount is equal to 0, signal the write, and then signal the mutex that they're done writing, or that they're done reading back and forth. <clears throat> We've seen this one already, Dining Philosopher's Problem. This is the one with the rice and the chopsticks, where we have shared data. How are we going to implement this one? Well, we have the data set is the shared data. And then the reader-writer is the database. This is uh, I.O. on your device. This is These are requests for resources, where so, okay, so <coughs> processes don't use I.O. exclusively. So they might have, you know, a USB drive that's copying a file from a USB drive to a hard drive. So you have two pieces. Of, you need a USB drive and you need a hard drive. Or you have a CD-ROM or a DVD. <coughs> so you're using the DVD player and then you're using the speakers to play something. So your process is using multiple I.O. devices. needs both devices in order to perform the I.O. request. Otherwise, it can't perform the request. I.O. runs simultaneously, by the way. CPU runs processes um, sim se uh, sequentially. <coughs> One process at a time is using the CPU. CPU can run automatically, simultaneously with any of the I.O. I.O. runs together. So you have CD-ROM drive works with the hard drive, works with the USB drive. All that stuff can work simultaneously. Think of them as all separate processors, but they're not processors, which is kind of interesting. Um, so here's your shared data. <coughs> and we have the semaphore chopsticks 5 initialized to 1. And here's our sample implementation of it using the weight and the signal. So we have a semaphore implementation here, where we have the structure of the philosopher. I've already gone through this scenario, so we know what this is about from previous lecture. When we have, uh, they need two chopsticks. There's an odd amount, and there's a 
odd amount of philosophers. So they're never going to get an even amount of resources with an odd distribution like that. Uh, so we have a um, weight on chopstick, weight on chopstick. We have both eat it, then signal and put them back down. Think a little bit. So they're called dining philosophers because they think they're philosophers and they eat. So think, think is what waiting. Wait, run it, wait, run it. Problem with the semaphore is the correct use of the semaphore operation. <clears throat> so we have the signal mutex, then we have a wait, we have a wait, we have a wait, kind of scenarios that might exist. So admitting a wait or a signal or both of them could cause a problem. If you waited a process and you never woke it up, you're introducing problems. You've got starvation going on. Or if you signal too much, then you have problems as well. <clears throat> So monitors, new vocabulary word for you. It's not, in fact, the word semaphore, the word mutex is the word monitor. These are just vocab words to describe these th concepts I'm talking about. Um, mutex is an on or an off. The semaphore is the wait signal, wait signal. And those system call interfaces, the semaphore stuff. So actually mutexes can be system called as well. Monitors are higher levels. Higher level abstraction provides a convenient and effective mechanism for process synchronization, Java uses monitors. So only one process can be active within the monitor at a time. So it monitors the execution, which is why it's called monitors. <laughs> it observes and makes sure that only one process is running. It doesn't control each one of them. So semaphores say, hey, I'm waiting. Signal you to run. You're running, now I'm going to signal to me. Okay, now I'm waiting. So the processes are sending messages back and forth between themselves. Mm -hmm. If you're in a semaphore interface. In a monitor, there's no sending back and forth. Instead, the operating system itself is monitoring the activity that's going on. And it's doing its own synchronization. So when you use synchronize in Java, the JVM is monitoring the environment using monitors, essentially, to figure out if there's a problem, break it up. There's not going to be a problem, actually, because only one process is going to run at a time. One thread's going to run. So monitor, monitor name. We want to implement it ourselves. We have a shared variable declaration. We keep track of it with a shared variable if we're going to implement it this way. So systematic view of a monitor. We have an entry queue, and we have an exit queue that comes. This is the entry queue here where we have shared data. And then we have the operations that are going to be performed on it, the code that's going to work to create the environment. And this kind of bubble is showing you what's being watched, what's, what, what the monitor is actually observing in terms of um, the operations. One approach. Another approach. All right, another approach, another approach. Condition variables. So condition x and y. So two operations are on a condition variable, x weight X signal. So a process that invokes an operation is suspended on a wait. Or on a signal, it resumes one process, if any, that invokes a wait. So signal start, wait is wait. Think about it. Or signal is run if you're able to run. So monitors with condition variables can signal back and forth X and Y. So we have a queue associated with the waiting and the signaling and we can use it to synchronize what's going back into the shared area. So we can essentially do it uh, so that we can keep track of if, if, you're, if you're waiting, you're waiting. If you're running, you're signaling, and then you're going to come in. So here's a solution to the dining philosophers scenario where we have in monitors, thinking, hungry, eating, we have different states. So pick up a fork if we're hungry, test it. Do I have another fork? No, then put it back down. If I do have another fork, then eat. If not, wait. And put that. But we have to put it back down, so put down the fork. Which is how I.O. is synchronized. So if I'm a CD-ROM drive and I'm running, and I want to copy something in the hard drive, but somebody else is using the hard drive exclusively, or somebody else is using the memory, I don't have memory, I don't get it, then I'm the CD-ROM drive and I'm going to stop. And I can put the CD-ROM drive back so that the next item in the queue can go ahead and use the CD-ROM drive. So you can create problems yourself by actually double-clicking on multiple files simultaneously and copying them to multiple different areas and opening up different windows and doing stuff. And then you'll notice that the system will lock up occasionally if you're on a Windows system because uh, it's using a synchronization technique that it won't. 
it won't detect itself fast enough, so it'll prob probably end up with problems. So. so we have a test. So the idea here is to put it back down. Pick up the fork. If we can eat, eat. Pick up another fork. We can eat it, eat it. If not, put the fork back down. Or at the end, put the fork deck back down when we're done eating as well. So, And then the test code will say, if I'm hungry and I have two forks, eat. If I'm going to do that. Otherwise, don't bother picking up the forks if I'm not hungry. So you can test the state and say, okay, I'm ready to run. So in your copy command, you can actually implement, well, you don't actually have to go this far. You don't have to do anything for that. But if you wanted to, you could put in a state variable that says, in, that would be a three. That, that would be a full empty and a how many are in there kind of thing. So, um, so let's see. So yeah, no, this does, would not apply towards your, re, towards your uh, producer consumer model. Um, so it's only with multiple resources. So each philosopher invokes the operation to pick up, put down, and using the following sequence. Pick up, eat, put down. Pick up, eat, put down. So it has to put it down when it's done eating it. So It's like somebody releasing a CD-ROM drive when you're done writing to it. Put it back. So. And we have some variables here in terms of the semaphore. Semaphore mutex, semaphore next. And integer count. Next count is equal to zero. And uh, let's see what we have here. Just some sample code that uh, goes through setting a mutex and an X. So, In terms of the monitor implementation for each one of the conditional variables, we have uh, initially setting it to zero, then setting a counter. So we can use a counter with this as well in terms of its implementation. No one's going to do this. You're going to use something that does it automatically, like Java, and put the word synchronize on there, and synchronize is going to essentially do this for you. It keeps a counter, so it's going to put it all together. Uh, so let's see. Synchronization examples. Let's see. So we have Solaris, Windows XP, Linux, and pthreads. So on a Solaris system, it's implemented using a variety of locks to support multitasking multi-threading, including real-time threads and multi-processing. So we have operating system support for it. Um, uses adaptive mutexes. Most of your Linux and Unix systems will use mutexes um, for efficient use for protecting the data. Uses conditional variables and readers and writer locks when longer sections of code need to be accessed. And uh, turnstiles in order to uh, list the threads waiting to acquire either adaptive mutexes or reader writer locks. Windows XP uses spin locks and multiple processes, multiple pro multi process systems. Uses an interrupt mask to protect access to global resources. And also provides dispatcher objects. And dispatcher objects may also provide events. So an event action must be a conditional variable controlled by the operating system itself. You don't see the word mutexes in here, you don't really see the word signals in here doesn't use any of those concepts that Unix uses. It has its own separate technique that's built into the XP kernel environment that runs its own thing through its own event handler. Because it's in an event, it's using something that has to be dispatched and then kept. So you can usually see this log and then the log is dealt with when the kernel is ready to start dealing with this stuff. So. Linux disables interrupts to implement uh, shorts, shorts uh, critical sections. Otherwise, we can use semaphores and spin locks as well. So, you don't have to know what each one of these different operating systems does, but it just sort of gives you an example to put it in perspective. They all have different approaches to process synchronization. Some of them have more of a system interface to it. Some of them don't. So, P-thread synchronization. The API uses is operating system independent includes uh, mutex locks conditional variables. So if you get on a Linux system, you use pthreads. So instead of a Unix with, with threads, which is going to have a slightly different, but it's it's a system call interface to it. Non-portable extensions include the read-write locks and the spin locks. Some of you use atomic transactions for system models and for uh, logical base recovery and checkpoints. The concept here is different. This is not part of process synchronization. It's the definition of atomic transactions as it occurs. Don't necessarily need to know this information for this <coughs> course, but by definition, all you need to know is essentially this is what we're working with is, an, is a, a transaction that can't be interrupted. 
it runs and then it stops running. So there's different ways of controlling it. I'm going to skip this section. You don't have to read this section in the book. It's not testable material uh, because the concept itself is above and beyond the course. But um, So I'm going to kind of skip through this. We don't need to know any actually past slide number uh, 45, I believe this is, or 46. Don't need to know anything about atomic transactions for this course or system models, which are going to be associated with the transactions. If you're taking a database course, it would probably be more appropriate in terms of uh, management stuff, types of storage media. This is extremely old and outdated. You don't need to know about that, I mean, unless we still have tape drives somewhere. Um, don't really need it. Or lost uh, log recovery, log based recovery. Nah, log based recovery algorithms. No. Checkpoints. No. Concurrent transactions and serializability. No. Again, database concurrency management is something that to deal with in terms of database management. Serializability. That's another database concept as well. So, um, let's see if there's anything else in this lecture. Locking protocols. No. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. Nope, you don't have to know the rest of this chapter, actually. Just the process synchronization that comes out of it. These other topics that I'm missing are different scenarios in which we have time-based or serial transaction processing, which means we're going to take, as an example, a database. Let's just talk about databases for a second. We have the concept of the transaction where this insert, that update, and this thing all has to work together in order for a shopping cart transaction to occur or something. And so we have to lock the system to provide serialability, serial, serializability in a non-serialized environment to make these atomic transactions work properly. So these are all getting into different techniques that are associated with that. It goes away and above, above and beyond the scope of this, uh, of operating systems. But it's included in the book, so I figured I'd uh, just, and this is the lecture set from the book, but we're not going to cover it for this course. Questions, comments, concerns on process synchronization, which is chapter number six. Nope, then we are done for today. So let me stop this video.